Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Arthur Brooks, President of the American Enterprise Institute, and it's my delight to welcome you to this address by Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana. He will be talking about his new book, Keeping the Republic. Governor Daniels is no stranger to AEI and to many of you. He's spoken here on many occasions. He has many friends and fans in the AEI community, uh, myself included, of course, and we're excited about his new book in which he talks about just how close we are to losing our republic, but just as importantly, how we can restore it to greatness. Uh, Mitch has in his book a wonderful phrase in which he advocates change that believes in you, which is his way of talking about the fact that he believes Americans, when properly informed of the facts, will pull together to make the necessary changes to save our country. Governor Mitch Daniels. It's only appropriate that I come by here uh, uh, to uh, uh, pay due homage and give due thanks. Anything useful I have to say in this book or elsewhere, I probably learned at AEI. And, uh, and uh, the only difference here is that I, in writing this book, I know I actually gave, due, I gave a, a appropriate credit to Arthur and a couple of your other uh, products. So thanks, as always, for that and for the chance to be here. Um, the best part of being here is always uh, that I go away smarter than anybody in the crowd, and so the best way to ensure that is to speak very briefly and then start right into your question. So let me, uh, if it's uh, the most useful way to start, let me just try to summarize brutally what uh, went into this little work of mine. Um, when people ask me about the, the book, it, I, I, I've fallen into the habit of telling them first what it isn't. So what it isn't? It isn't autobiographical. You can you can relax about that. <laughs> uh, it isn't a candidate's book. Uh, the book was outlined in the early months of last year, sold in the summer of last year, written in the fourth quarter mainly of last year, and on into this year. And I've uh, I've been telling folks uh, this is absolutely true that the first sentence of the outline and the first was going to be the first sentence of the book. I was really proud of, you know, as a rookie at this. And so it said, so many books are written because the author intends to run for president of the United States. This one's written specifically because I don't. <laughs> but I'm alarmed about the country. I want to tell you why. I thought, well, that's good. That's a grabber, you know. The publisher wouldn't have it. Or the, actually, the agent wouldn't have it. And uh, But it isn't that, that is that was not it. It was always intended as... Um, uh, a few reflections, hoping to make a little constructive contribution to what may be the most important national conversation that we've had in a very long time. The contention of the book, and uh, if, you, uh, if you fall off the bus at the, at the predicate, then you won't really want the book and you wouldn't want to go where the argument leads. But the premise is that we are facing uh, uh, a survival level threat to the America we've known that it is its principal symptom, not its cause, but its principal symptom is the debts we've amassed for ourselves and the debts that are coming if we don't change direction in a significant way, that they threaten uh, something even larger than our standard of living. They threaten the American, the sense of optimism, which has always animated this country in good times or bad, that um, uh, in which Americans you know, stubbornly have said, even in bad times, tomorrow will be better, my kids will live better than I will. And uh, uh, if, that's, if that's fraying around the edges, that is really something to worry about, quite apart from GDP and median income rates and all those things that uh, we tend to write and talk about. And um, if that's not enough for you, the contention is that there's something even beyond that, and that's the, the whole principle of self-governance, as we've known it in this country, is on trial. In a very amateur way that I tried to be careful not to be pretentious about, I insisted on an early chapter which uh, summed up the you know, little I knew about the long history of skepticism about self-government in, in philosophy and very much uh, embodied in our founders' uh, deep concern that this experiment they were giving birth to 
would be fragile and might not last. So everybody in this room, although not all products of the American uh, K-12 educational system, will know exactly what the title's about. Ben Franklin, walking out of Independence Hall, says, uh, of course, uh, when asked, it's a republic if you can keep it, expressing even then the, the, the worry that uh, the skeptics of history were right, that government of and by the people might would eventually lead to uh, excesses, would lead to um, a majority deciding they could expropriate the property of the rest, that the affluence and very success that that democracy would give or uh, free institutions would give rise to would lead ultimately to complacency and and lethargy and and uh, eventually to failure. Uh, rummaging around for this book, I stumbled over this interesting little uh, nugget that I didn't know before, but on the very earliest coinage of the Republic, there was a Latin phrase, which I'm about to mangle. I need to get somebody to coach me on this. Uh, but it said, uh, exitus in dubio est, on the coin, that the outcome is in doubt. It's a very interesting thing uh, to make your, your national expression at a time of... <laughs> At a time of all that hope and you know revolutionary fervor, but uh, but a pretty honest thing to say. And um, so, um, if one goes that far, if one if you if you accept when you look at the arithmetic, and I keep stressing redundantly to uh, people, uh, this is not a philosophical judgment. This is not an ideological point. Obviously, I have a set of of uh, convictions on that, but, but I try to, I say to people all the time, uh, let's have the ideological debate some other time. For today, can we agree that the arithmetic here does not work? You can't run up a mortgage payment like we're about to. The debt service alone, you all know this, on the track we're on, will permanently stunt the American economy. It has done it to other countries. There's no escape past a certain point. The experts can debate exactly where the tipping point is, but we're not far, you know, there, we are not distinguishable from Greece, Spain, Italy, Portugal, except by degree, and it won't take long to get where they are. And w with, the, with the further consequences that would flow from that, the loss of leadership in the world, pretty much a rule of nature, I think, nobody follows a pauper. Th those countries that until very recently were modeling themselves after us, imitating our free institutions. History had ended. Remember, it was just yesterday. Um, I'd love to believe it's because they all got a hold of the Federalist Papers and were just swept away by the logic and the power of the argument, right? But I don't think so. It was because it was working. It was because the American economic engine was generating opportunity and, and, un, un, and unimaginable wealth and prosperity, and um, uh, if that begins to erode, I mean, they'll fall back on the cultural traditions that are, you know, have very little to do in other parts of the world, in the Confucian world, in the Islamic world, for instance, with, with uh, individual liberty and dignity and, and certainly with free institutions. Um, I didn't think the world needed it, however. Another tome on the debt. You can call AEI for a good one and a lot of other places too. I treat with it, but I try not to be too tedious about it. Um, I was trying to raise these other questions. One question, one, one uh, chapter called The Great Inversion asked the question, who's in charge here? Is, is governmental action, public service, what we do, as some of us were taught, to enable the the important realms of life, the private realms of business and voluntary associations and so forth to flourish? Or is that really where in this complex world where the important decisions have to be made? And then closely related to that, what kind of people do we intend to be? My catchphrase for this, creatures of dignity or objects of therapy? 
there are some people who in their sincere heart of hearts believe that the vast majority or at least a large number of Americans just can't cope these days. It's just too complicated. And left to their own devices, they might pick the wrong health care. They might send their kid to the wrong school. They'll take a credit card they shouldn't have. They'll take out the wrong kind of mortgage. Oh, my gosh, they'll buy the wrong light bulb. <laughs> so they need us. And um, there are implications that flow from that that, as I, that I think should bother us at least as much as the threat to our material standard of living. So that's what the book tries to be about. The book tries to say that neither side of our national debate has given Americans enough credit. There's a huge element of faith in this. I acknowledge it. I think the book's explicit on this, but it was well written. I didn't, I didn't find the quote till after the book went to print, but uh, you know, it's a common enough observation that democracy is and always was a leap of faith. So I'm ready to leap, and I hope that our national debate in the next 12 to 14 months, that people will take this leap. When I say not giving Americans enough credit, first of all, I mean the credit that they can run their own lives. I would hope the choices we make in terms of national policy reflect that. Uh, we've done it in Indiana in terms of health care. I think we've proven to ourselves that people of modest means, average folks, really are, you know, really can make good consumerist decisions. Uh, once you give them the opportunity to do that. Uh, they know where their kid could go to school. We've given them the opportunity to do that. Uh, but over and over, I would gamble on the capacity of the American people, first of all, to live as creatures of dignity, as autonomous people. Will, will some make mistakes? Of course. We, humans always will. But will society work better? And is it more in keeping with an ethic of of um, liberty to give them that uh, every opportunity to make those choices sure it is. I exhume and uh, for instance the old idea of the negative income tax as a way to provide basic subsistence level income to everybody but after that let them decide. You know you don't have to come kiss somebody's ring for a coupon for food and somebody else's for a coupon for housing and and um, somebody else is for medical care. We're going to trust you. So when, when Arthur notices the title of the last chapter, which I thought about making the subtitle of the book, I was talked out of, I think wisely, but still, it's a play, of course, on President Obama's successful marketing slogan of 2008, Change You Can Believe In. Thrilling phrase. It took me about a year to ask myself, wait a minute, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and, of course, the point is it, the magic of the, the reason it works so well. I think the ma magic of the marketing was it can mean whatever the listener decides it means. It's, you can invest in it. You know, what I think change is, that must be what he's talking about. Pretty savvy. But not something to govern by. And so I sort of threw out this slight twist, change it believes in you. And that would say to, to, to our fellow citizens, these guys think you can't cut it. We don't believe that. And we're, we're going to do everything we can to uh, enable you to take greater charge of your own life. And secondly, folks on both sides don't think that we have the capacity to make big, bold decisions and change direction when we come together as a body politic, and we're prepared to gamble on that, too. I'm going to tell you what we think the facts of life are. We're going to give you an honest accounting of the kind of changes that we'd have to make. I'm going to tell you why whatever dislocation or disruption or, quote, pain would go with those changes, it's a lot less than the pain of just drifting on, on our current track. You want to see pain, just keep going where we're going. As I said, both sides, I think, sell the American people a little short. There are folks with whom I would agree about most things who you know, can't wait to tell you these days about how dependent the American people are and almost how degenerate they've become in this dependence, how, uh, yeah, how, how fewer and fewer are paying any income taxes. I know that's all that's true. But I suggest that, uh, first of all, 
The only operating philosophy makes any sense in this life is optimism. You know, old coach's cliche, if you think you can or you can't, you're right. And secondly, that, that the, uh, uh, I think I've seen evidence, at least in our state and elsewhere, that the American people um, still at their core are people born to liberty and that if we, at least we ought, to, we ought to make that our wager. And if we would summon the best from them, we must assume the best about them. So that's a little bit of a message to both sides. The book, uh, uh, somebody asked for a quick characterization. I said, oh, I think it's a nice blend of obstinate optimism and panic. <laughs> um, with an emphasis on the former. And um, uh, I t it's not, another thing, it's not, I hope, it's not a manifesto. I, I feel like you shouldn't sound off the way I do in this book and not offer not a complete list, but at least a list of the kind of things that you think would make a difference. So I do. As I say, most of them I probably learned from somebody here. Uh, happy to go into those in the question period if, if you like. But it's not the central, it's not the central point of the book. Um, the central point is that uh, there is a great endeavor here, uh, something that is Im important in the immediate uh, crisis that we're facing economically but, and, and, and in terms of our social fabric, but that also can be the latest American contribution to history when we prove that, yes, indeed, you can keep a republic, you can, uh, you can govern by consent of the governed in a way that's affirming of the highest value of all the liberty of, of each of us. Thanks for your invitation and for the questions I'm looking forward to. I think we're supposed to wait for a, yeah. Welcome, Governor. Um, I uh, was at an event last week on the Hill. Uh, I'm John Wortman with the Association of American Geographers, by uh -huh. the way. I was at an event on the Hill last week that the Committee for Responsible Budgeting put on that had this slogan called to go big for the Super Committee. Yeah. And they talked about setting a goal of $4 trillion, not just $1.5 trillion. So I wanted to ask, you know, what's your perspective on the Super Committee? And I think the consensus coming out of, of that event, you know, everybody from Mike Crapo to Andy Stern said, everybody's got to have skin in the game for it to be successful. Hey. So what's your take on the Super Committee? Yeah, well, uh, that uh, I wish them well and be a nice start if they did what uh, they've been tasked with doing. But it not, you know, but I'm with, I'm in the, put me down in the go big crowd. I couldn't be there, but they asked for a tape. I don't know if they showed it or not, but I, uh, what I remember saying is, you know, it's like T-shirt, go big or go home. We better go big or we'll all go home. And um, four trillion, by the way, is by, is also just the start. If you look at the number of zeros uh, um, we are facing. Um, so um, here's a perspective. Two things about the super committee. I mean, the 1.2 trillion. I know in in Washington perspective, that's a that's a big number. Um, a lot of governors I know have, have cut far more than that as a percentage of what was going on, but this just, let's just accept that it. it's a very large number and, and uh, larger than something they've done before. Consider this, though. Let's just assume they do it and assume it's real. It's not one of those, you know, uh, deals that is ultimately not delivered on, on the spending side. Um, That'd be great, be a nice down payment. In the, but in the last several months, I mean, one of the main themes of the book is we should start resolving every single national question till further notice, be years from now, in favor of economic growth in the private sector. Everything. Everything else is important, but nothing rivals that. Well, in the last, uh, by way of illustration, in the last few months, uh, all these terrifying numbers they're looking at um, are based on a growth forecast for this year of four point something. <laughs> and it's going to be one, I guess. Well, little rule of thumb, every one of those three missing points 
is $750 billion of debt over 10 years. So if they do the 1.2, bully for them, and I'd be leading the cheers. But it, that would be one step forward, and the economy alone took us two steps back, and the problem got bigger. So uh, that's why $4 trillion is hardly too much to talk about. And uh, I'm for them trying to get the 1.2. We ought to immediately open the discussion about the next increment and the next. In terms of skin in the game, yes, indeed. Both in terms, because for one thing, it's going to take a lot of skin because this is a big game. For another, there will have to be a sense of equity and shared participation. You know, I, I refuse to use these words about sacrifice. You want, again, you want to see sacrifice, just keep drifting. We'll all sacrifice, and the poor and the young will get it in the neck first, like they tend to do. So, but let's say shared participation. Now, my advice, uh, if I were given any, to the president would be: you're looking in the wrong place. You know, ratcheting up tax rates on a, on the people who are paying almost all the you know, big part, biggest portion of the bills now is that's not it may suit your sense of social equity, but it won't solve this problem at all. Um, uh, you're looking in the wrong place. You, if you want wealthier people to contribute, I do, start by, by stopping sending them benefits they have no need for. Means test all these programs, as they always should have been. The only, the only reason they weren't was based on a political calculation. Right? It's all in the book. And second, uh, uh, tax reform that lowers and flattens the rates and closes as many of the existing deductions as we possibly can or caps their total, you know, the maximum that any one person can use. The kind of tax change that will, I mean, we're going to need a lot more revenue. People say, doesn't taxes have to be some of it? You bet. Tax revenues. The question is how you get them. What's the practical way to get them? And if we were to do that, we know this from repeated demonstrations of it, you could trigger a faster growth rate, you'd have a lot more revenue, and incidentally, wealthier people, might be a different set of people, you know, coming and going from that bracket, but wealthier people would pay more, a lot more, and a higher percentage. Happens every time. That help? Uh, you just made a point, and I have, I'm going to question it, and that is you, I think you may have said uh, social equity uh, need, you know, is, was mentioned by the president as, as something that kind of is equated with uh, fairness or mm -hmm. something like that, or equality. And um, my sort of, uh, a little ill at ease with that insofar as um, social equity could be associated with lots of inequality and there's nothing wrong with inequality and there's nothing wrong with uh, with wealth and I, I have a sense that the con we conservatives kind of run away from that issue and say well if you do and you said I'm, I'm picking on you excuse me. <laughs> if you said that's it well for. that's not so I heard you I got yeah, the yeah. invitation I've taken it yeah yeah and and that is that uh, we're gonna do growth but it's kind of like letting these guys get away with murder, you know, letting them get away with this equity argument. Oh, but we'll have b better growth if you come with us. It's t a little too mercenary. I, th I think we could do both, you know, and that is say, oh, well, yeah, yeah, we're really evil, but you'll be better off. Well, no, we're not. Anyway, well, any thoughts you might have? Yeah, well, I, I may not have expressed myself too well, but I mean, I don't think, uh, if, if you were uh, to read the book, I don't think you'd come away with any sense that I buy into any of that. Of course not. Um, the, um, I do think that in terms of, um, of gathering together the necessary very large consensus to do very large things, it will be necessary to do a couple things. One is try to mute our arguments over other issues, uh, and I, which I recommend and recommend in this book. Uh, another would be to have a to have a sense uh, among a, a, a sense among people that everyone will be a part of the solution somehow. But no, you're not going to get a I hope uh, not even an inadvertent uh, uh, intimation out of me that there's anything wrong. I mean, you know, for instance, we have structured our entire administration very openly from the beginning in Indiana around a single objective: to raise the disposable income of our people. <laughs> We've done everything to create a more pro-growth environment 
and I've said over and over and over again, it's about creating the opportunity for people who start with little or nothing to rise and one day, you know, b become uh, wealthy. And I, I report often that and this happens often when people in business come to see me about some issue or problem. Uh, I hear them out. Almost always, they are thoughtful about it, and on their way out the door, they say, now, is there anything we can do? What can we do for Indiana? And I always say the same thing, make money. I want you to make money. That's the first act of corporate citizenship. And if you do, eventually you'll hire somebody else and give them a chance in life, and, and uh, we'll all be better off. So you're, it's an appropriate caution. I'll be careful how I speak to these things. No, I appreciate it. Same lines. Um, I get so frustrated with this fair thing. What's fair and all right. this? And, and the word fair is is like love. You know, it means different things to different people. Um, how would you handle that when I, I see it in all the leftists? You know, talk about fair amount of money. How do you how do you handle that? I think I just. I tend to stress that the, the the real objective here is upward mobility. It always has been for me. I don't I don't think there is a top end. Uh, I do think it's useful for people who believe in in free markets and free enterprise to to, to make this plain because m many people either assume or have been taught to assume what we're thinking about is uh, first and foremost are those who've already benefited from these institutions. I don't. I bet you don't. So I mean, I, I frequently say something like, you know, my job as a temporary employee of people of Indiana is really not to see that people of great wealth get wealthier. They'll look after themselves. My job is to see with people with little or nothing can get wealthy. And that really is how I look at it. You know, you know, let's face it. Milton Friedman taught it best, you know, the time to worry about big business when it gets in bed and gets in cahoots with big government. And there's a lot of that in this town. And we don't, I, sometimes we don't call it out as often as we could, you know. From the days of the guilds on, governing, uh, uh, um, uh, people who, uh, who were in the political, in the uh, economic system have looked for a way to get government to keep the outs out. And uh, we should be just as uh, diligent, maybe a little more so, in spotting that and indicating our, uh, uh, our, our, our dislike of it. Yeah. Hi, congratulations on your book. Yeah. You well, hold that thought. I don't know if anybody's bought it yet. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. You certainly have a strong opinions about the national policies and strategies we ought to be implementing. And so, as a, I guess a side note, um, do you think you'll be an asset to the eventual GOP ticket as a vice president? My second quick, quick question is, what will ultimately determine that decision? I got one of those things that comes around the internet, you know, that uh, your, your friends send you. They're funny things. Uh, a couple years ago, and, and it was pretty good. It was a list. Uh, it was going around all my mail buddies. It, it was a list of uh, um, the appropriate answers to questions your wife asks. <laughs> they were all pretty funny, but the one that stuck with me was it was the last one. You know, so it'd be you know, question. Here's what you say. Question. Here's what you say. The last one was, does this make me look fat? And the answer was. There is no answer to this question. <laughs> there is no answer to this vice presidential question. I mean, first of all, uh, uh, I really don't know. I mean, it, it's entire, it'll be entirely up to the, to the nominee to decide uh, what's an asset and what is, and isn't and, uh, you know, who they're most compatible with. And so it isn't going to happen. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, therefore, I'm not spending any time uh, thinking about it. Uh, this uh, yeah. Governor, do you support the, uh, I'm sorry to put everybody to sleep, the proposed GASB rules for accounting state municipal pensions and retiree health benefits? And if so, how balanced would Indiana's budget be if you accounted by those rules? Well, uh, I don't know about the rules in every respect, but yes, in general, we need, we, we need to count the um, th these burdens, and they haven't been, as we all know. We have been found to have, uh, and it matches up with our own calculations, the second or third lightest such burden in the country. 
I, so I have no I have no particular concerns from an Indiana standpoint about a different, more uh, open uh, accounting. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, and someone has calculated this. I think it's the best basis. The, the per capita cost, the per capita cost of meeting the current pension obligations, and I think we're third lightest. Really, all we have to do, our, our, our pension fund, uh, I haven't looked for a while, probably has suffered in the last couple of months, but our, our, our biggest pension fund was uh, around 92% funded, which is considered full. Um, there's an old legacy fund from back when, which... Um, is on a pure pay-as-you-go basis. All we have to do is make an annual payment, which we have been doing, that amounts to just a, a single-digit percent of the state budget. As long as we keep doing that, that's taken. That's absolutely taken care of. Um, by the way, I instructed our pension funds a year ago to back their discount rate down to whatever can look like the most conservative number, and we did. I think we're at seven. Maybe it needs to go lower. I don't know, but you know. Uh, We'll leave our successors. Uh, there'll be problems, but this won't be a big one. But absolutely, there's been a lot of subterfuge and deception or self-deception going on, and um, I'm, I, I gladly support some revi some revision of those rules. Can you get somebody on the way up? Now get Michael and then uh, Jim up front, maybe. Uh, Michael Brown with AEI and the Washington Examiner, uh, Governor. Um, and this, a uh, few months ago, in this same room, another governor from, I think, New Jersey was here talking <laughs> about um, what is that guy's name? the need to face long-term uh, entitlements problems. He talked about Medicare and noted that Thunder had not struck him dead when he did yeah. so, um, <laughs> and about Social Security in similar terms. I am not hearing, perhaps you are, the current Republican candidates for president talking about these things in anything like those specific terms. And I wondered, A, if you shared that observation, and B, what you could tell us about the chances that you or this other governor that spoke here uh, might get into the race to fill a vacuum if that one exists. Mm. Well, I can't quarrel with the, I mean, I think it's an accurate observation, and I hope the, uh, the uh, point is that they have not yet stepped out on these issues. I really hope they will. It's the central message, I suppose, of this uh, little thing I've written here, you know, as I tried to outline earlier. We need to have this conversation. I have a little, and, it, and this Chris, uh, or Governor Christie uh, apparently testified. Uh, he and I have found that, yeah, you, you can speak uh, grown up to citizens, and uh, they don't always shoot the messenger, and um, uh, maybe I've told the story here before. I got a friend who, uh, don't ask me why, raises wolves. <laughs> All right? You know, I said, you know, what's, what's wrong with like a bulldog or something? No, he raises <laughs> wolves. And I asked him one time what it's like. He said, well, they're playful. He says, I like them. He says, you, I said, you get in there? Yeah, I get right in the pen with them. I said, what well, they do? He said, they, run, they jump up and they put their paws right on you here. You know, they'll lick your face and things. I said, really? I said, isn't that... Isn't that, you know, risky? He said, oh, no. He says, now, the only thing is you can feel them doing this all the time. He says, don't back up. That, you know, that's when they eat you, see. So, <laughs> so the first time he told me that, I said, well, I know what that's like. I dealt with the White House press corps. <laughs> but, you know, an issue like this is a little bit like that. And the reason I think Chris Christie has already stamped himself as a really important figure in our <laughs> national life, uh, and I have tried to do... You know, I don't live in New Jersey. You've got to have a special style, you know, <laughs> if you live in Tony Soprano's state. But, but, uh, but I, think, I think a lot of our, our fellow elected officials are just more hesitant than they ought to be. And at this moment in our history, I think that's very risky. So, no, it, not yet, but I'm very, very hopeful, and I'm certainly going to encourage these uh, folks every chance I get to, you know, let's lay it out there. And uh, again, uh, I've been saying recently that I think it's pretty apparent now. I felt this way for a long time. The president's got trouble getting reelected. And Michael, you're the, you're the historian, and I'm not. But you know, the conditions. I, I have never seen good news coming in this economy. Not for a year and a half. We in Indiana have been acting just like a lot of those businesses. 
that we all read about. We've been husbanding cash and and uh, uh, being very, very careful against the possible downturn. And um, now I think it's pretty clear that there's a good chance he'll be running under really adverse economic conditions. His policies will have manifestly failed. They already, that can already be said. Now, uh, I'm a little concerned that uh, our side, my side, I'm sorry, um, our nominee might just decide, well, that's all it takes. I'll just kind of play it safe. And I can get elected as the default option. And that might work. I don't know. But my question then would be, then what? You know, we, what really matters is not just winning the election, important as that is. What matters is winning it on the basis that allows us to make big change. And so I'm going to encourage in my little way um, our candidates and our eventual nominee to, as I say, trust the American people a little more and step out there. Governor, uh, I was really pleased to hear you say that there is a little noted distinction between raising tax rates and raising tax revenues. I think that point gets lost mm -hmm. in the debate all too often. But the current tax structure was not handed down on Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my question is this. When the President leaves the country and Vice President Daniels is dictator for a couple of days, <laughs> What are the appropriate... You talk about a pessimistic vision for America. <laughs> God. Our wildest dream. Uh, what are the appropriate tax rates? Yeah. Because yeah. the rates we've got today, nobody can argue it were rationally established across the board. So right. estate, personal, corporate income, capital gains, what should they be? Right. Now, I always quote late great Bill Simon who said it'd be nice if America had a tax code looked like someone designed it on purpose. <laughs> and we should design one on purpose. Um, and the purpose should be the fastest possible growth of the private sector. And I think most folks here would probably agree on the general um, nature of that, which would be uh, uh, far fewer exceptions and loopholes, if you want to call them that, therefore, and, and lower flatter rates as close to flat as, as we can get them. And um, that um, uh, it would be neutral across different types of investment, and money would find its way to the places that create more jobs. So, and by the way, I think when you're looking around, scratching around for reasons for optimism, there's a wide agreement. Can't seem to get the president interested, but there's a wide agreement even among some of his allies that this general direction makes a lot of sense. So maybe this might be one of those first big steps in a big step next administration. But Jim, you, you make a real, you make an important point, and I try to deal with it in this book, um, as to what the rates ought to be. Um, we're going to need a lot more revenue. I'm a, I would argue, for, I think, for the lowest rates consistent with national necessity. But in that, if you could get to that sort of system, that more pro-growth system that I just described, uh, I, for one, would be open to some discussion about exactly what the rate is. I, I just don't think it's time for a theological argument over 20 versus 21 versus 22, or X percent of GDP versus Y percent of GDP. We got an emergency here, and if. I'm, I frankly am for whatever rate generates the most revenue, well, that would be as high, I suppose, as you can put it, without injuring growth and therefore shooting yourself in your own foot. Am I making sense? You know, I, I mean, in this imaginary scenario you just depicted, you'd be trying to get together people who would have very different views, and uh, you know, I wouldn't get stuck there. Um, we're going to need a lot more revenue. If, if I had that scepter you're talking about, there'd be a heck of a lot less spending, a heck of a lot less spending today and, and, in, and in the commitments of tomorrow. But under the most, under the most, the boldest such program of, of right-sizing government, we can, you and I could cook up, you'd need a lot more revenue. That's just the math. And so, 
um, talk. I'd say you know talk to me about the la about the where that rate comes to rest. Am I making sense? Yeah, okay. Well. okay. Well, I don't mean to, I, I don't mean to agree. I mean uh, that I explain myself. <laughs> yes, sir. Gene Sterling, the Urban Institute. Hi, oh, hey. Uh, I've asked you to maybe to put on a little bit your Farmer O and B hat, and I also I guess your governor's hat. Is my sense is that we always debate the short run budget. You know, one time it was one year, three year. Now we debate ten year budgets. But yeah. in point of fact, it's this long run budget that's continually out of balance. So every time we do a deficit reduction agreement, the short run, and the long run's out of balance, we just are always back in the soup. Yeah. Is there some way that you would suggest that we can get legislators to actually focus first? on the long run budget to get it in order, still have the fights over the short run budget, whether yeah. it's, it's whether it's the national level, we should, president should at least propose a budget that's balanced over the economic cycle, or whether built in growth and programs should be stopped mm -hmm. at some level, sunsetted, I don't, what, what would you suggest to get this long run budget in order first, uh, and give it some priority in, in a budget process? Yeah, it's where a very it just has thank you, it's a very important question. Um, by the way, you, you just, tossed off a couple ideas I think are all worth considering, you know, the um, sunsetting and the like. Now, um, I hope this is responsive. Here's one maybe small window that I see. When I ask myself, uh, what is it that, w that even a bold reformist administration could do that would start to make some real difference now, uh, I do tend to think about uh, reform in the safety net programs, maybe starting with Social Security, even though it doesn't make much difference in the short term, it doesn't make any difference in the short term, but it could be, I think, sold to a reluctant Congress as the sort of thing that might make some real difference by sending a very positive signal to the world and to ourselves that we're not going broke. And ironically, to start taking long-term steps like that, that don't take effect for quite a while, which Congress probably would like, uh, but might make some near-term difference. Um, as to uh, you know budget processes and so forth, I, I can tell you, having dealt now with four two-year budgets, everything that's been written about that's true. It's a whole lot better than what we're doing now, uh, to, to at least stretch to a biennial budget. Um, but uh, I just imagine anyway that the day is going to have to come when when people are prepared to bite down hard at least once and lower the trajectory of where we're currently headed. Yeah. I just have a quick question on capital gains. Now Warren Buffett loves to complain that he doesn't pay enough in taxes because he most of his, what he pays in taxes on capital yeah. gains and, you know, um, and then he just likes to joke, oh, well, you know, why am I paying, you know, why is my secretary paying more tax than I am? Mm -hmm. And like, well, you know what, you should just send a big old check to the Treasury. Uh, but should, I've heard discussions that capital gains should be counted as income. I mean, would you support a move towards that and um, maybe then raise, like, the top rate, like, uh, it would be focused on, like people making just over 500,000 500, a year, like having a rate for, for that, like just a different a, capital gains rate for, you mean, well, no, no, like a graduated, rate, just, just progressive eliminate, capital gains? No, rate? eliminate the capital gains and just count that as income. Uh, 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 just normal uh, income, just like a, a, like a salary, like my parents make or something like that. Yeah. Well, you know, back, back home, this whole Warren Buffett thing, they, they, what the guy in the diner typically says to me is, what's stopping him? All right, you know, like, all right, like you said, get out your checkbook. And while you're at it, share your tax advisor with your secretary, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I personally believe, you know, consistent with a everything, growth trumps everything uh, policy that you ought, we ought to move as far as we can get in the direction of of taxing, uh, basically, uh, what it translates to is consumption as opposed to investment and savings and so forth. And um, the, the kind of tax reform that Jim's talking about probably takes you more in that direction. Uh, ideally, we would, we would set uh, rates uh, um, that uh, we would we have a tax system that excluded um, income from savings. It's already been taxed probably several times on the way to that capital gains calculation.
Thank you, Governor. Um, you spoke a little bit about um, entitlements, and that's that's kind of like the long run driver of our budgets. So I was just curious, what would you like to see done with them? Would you like to see Congressman Ryan's plan implemented, or right. if not that explicitly, if you were dictator for a day, how would you get health care costs, the biggest driver of right. our deficit under control? Yeah, thanks. Well, the first thing I'd do is rename them. This came to me as I was sort of writing all this. Uh, that they, you know, there's something that always bugged me. I don't like the name because it, uh, uh, you know, I, George Carlin used to say, what's another good word for synonym? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we need another good word for this because uh, um, when I read, the way I read the founding documents, what you're entitled to as an American is uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness full stop. Now, after that, there's a lot of things we do wisely, properly, you know, the, for each other, but these are things we decided to do as a free people governing ourselves, and that includes, you know, these programs you're asking about. So, small point, I know, but um, uh, sometimes words matter, and uh, I don't think Warren Buffett's entitled to a Social Security check just to take the extreme case. So the first thing I do is call them the safety net or you know, some better term than that, but let's, let's speak a little more clearly about them. Um, I throw out my own uh, ideas. They're not particularly nothing novel about any of them. You know, I'd means test, I'd fix the indexation, and we didn't start off over-indexing. It was one of those promises that politicians bolted onto the system along the way by votes. So you would, you know, you'd index, you know, you'd protect against inflation, but not overprotect, or at least not overprotect everybody like we do today. And the retirement age, of course. Uh, so I mean, those are the first three things I I do. But and on and Medicare, I think Ryan's headed the right direction. We talked a little bit about that. There's some stuff in the book about the our our uh, shift to consumerism, essentially HSA-like accounts in Indiana, and we've got a pretty interesting. Um, maybe the only large-scale demonstration project. We didn't start out to do it that way, but, you know, 86 percent, and we believe it'll be over 90 percent when the upcoming sign-up period's over, of state employees in Indiana uh, are in an HSA program, up from zero when we got there. About 86 percent of us, I'm win one. And, uh, uh, that's interesting because I discover from our actuaries that the average penetration in public sector America is two because the unions hate them. You know, it suggests that that worker doesn't need somebody to decide for them and intervene for them and so forth. I said, two? I said, then we've got to be like 0.5 of the two. <laughs> but in any event, we've got to uh, I, I think it, there's some useful lessons in it because we have double digit less, you know, normalized for everything. We have double digit lower uh, health care costs in that population than in what remains of the old fashioned uh, somebody else is paying for it model. So, uh, uh, Medicare, we all know it's a lot bigger problem and it's a lot harder problem, but he's, he's headed off. He's, 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 it's not a complete answer, but he's headed down the right track, surely. Again, let's trust people to choose what's best for them. Let's give those who are, let's give, let's concentrate the resources on those who need them most, so more money to the less uh, wealthy beneficiaries. Let's say you can adjust this for health care status. That's entirely doable and appropriate. Um, I don't pretend that solves the equation. There's still big issues out there that I, mentioned in the book, but don't attempt to answer completely end of life, obviously. But um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, you can't be serious about the problems we're talking about and not grasp, not act on these, and, and I hope fairly soon. And so uh, it is absolutely the right question. I think I was given the one more sign. Is there one more, and I'm, if I'm quick about it? I guess we got one more right there. Thank you. Um, my name is Morris McTeague, and um, I just wanted to ask you, Governor, what you would think about the idea of taking Social Security 
uh, Medicaid and Medicare and requiring that all of them be fully funded in every financial year from social security taxes mm. so that there would be a much broader base for funding them but there would also be a natural tension between the payers and the recipients of the benefits. Mm. At the same time you would de decrease income taxes by the same amount as you increase social security taxes. Well beats me. <laughs> I'd have to work it out, but it's a typical uh, McTeague uh, uh, interesting suggestion. I I can see the the uh, some uh, the immediate appeal, but I'd I'd want to see the arithmetic too. Um, that's the kind of thinking we need. It's the kind of thinking you're accustomed to encountering uh, here at AEI. So not not sure more. I'll, uh, here's a I'm not really ducking your question. It's just something I didn't mention earlier, but. I, I, I exhumed in the book this the negative income tax idea, um, which, like any thing of that size, has all kinds of problems with it. But compared to what? And um, I guess the reason I come back and look at it every now and then is that it's a way to say to citizens, uh, we're going to see that everybody has a subsistence level of income. But after that, you decide what to spend it on. And um, and and meanwhile, we get rid of what Friedman called the rag bag, the huge co cottage cottage industry, it doesn't begin to describe it, a huge industry around all these programs, all the middlemen and all the folks who make a living off them and, uh, and off constantly making them bigger. So changes like this that realign people's incentives and get them to think about these programs, think about the benefit they're receiving through the, uh, through the goodwill and compassion of their fellow citizens instinctively appeal to me. But now I'm going to have to go read up on yours and see if it meets that description. Thank you all very much.